when I first started this race, it was kind of by an accident. My chiropractor won a ticket to be on Hobart's people-powered bus, and he was leaving town for the weekend. So he gave me the ticket, knowing me, thinking that I would be the perfect person to fall into this adventure. And of course, that was the year that we had the 60 mile an hour winds. And I was right smack in the middle of it. And I, but I've been hooked ever since. <laughs> The most important thing is, if it can go forward, if it can stop, and it can float, that's all it really needs to do. It doesn't matter if it's an ace. It doesn't matter if it's gorgeous or glamorous or as far as you could take it because you don't have any money. Big deal. The best thing is the participation with the rest of the group. Show up, do it, no matter how funky it may be, just to do it is where the glory is. I have to admit, it uh, keeps me active, keeps me healthy, entertains me quite well. And seeing that this is a 25th silver anniversary, uh, this is kind of a special year all around. And this is coming up on this May would be my uh, 20th, uh, I believe my 21st year since I lost my kidneys. Um, hey, I, and I, anybody out there who's got a disability, I always say, there's nothing you can't do. Just go out and do it. Hi, my name is Hobart Brown, and I'm glorious founder of the World's Championship Kinetic Sculpture Race, which started with my son's tricycle right here. One night I was working and going to alter it a little bit, decided to make it a little bit better, a little bit better, and finally I had this big machine, which looks humble now in the shadow of all these great things that have been built over the last 25 years. But nevertheless, I was really involved in making this work and showed it to some of my friends, and they liked it, and they said, wow, that's neat. We're going to go home and build one, too, and so if we have two things, then we're going to have a race. So we planned to have a race down Main Street in Ferndale, which we did for three or four years, and then decided, wow, if this is fun, and it must be fun to make it longer. So then we extended the race 38 miles. We also included water and sand and highway and little roads. In other words, we included a little bit of all the terrain here in Humboldt County. So it made a great race, and also it tested not just like any other race, which might test one thing, but it tested the engineering, it tested the artistic, it tested the physical. In other words, this is a complete race. This is a race better than the Olympics because it tells what the human being can do with their own energy, their own power, because these are all people powered, and then still carry a payload. So we're working on problems now that they'll be, uh, we're working on tomorrow's problems today. When the fuels are out, when they run out of oil, we'll still be here pedaling and racing. And of course, every race must have a course. With a Le Mans start, the race leaves Arcata, takes off down old country roads, crosses bridges, goes over to Samoa Spit where there's sand and sand dunes and also Dead Man's Drop, cross the bridge in Eureka and someplace in Eureka spend the night, waking up the next morning to cross 2.2 miles of water over to the South Jetty, at that time spend the night there at Table Bluff, get up the next morning, do more of the South Jetty, all the way down to Crab Park, the Eel River, cross Eel River, up Slimy Slope, then wind around through cow pastures and cows and down country roads into the little Victorian town of Ferndale where the race comes to its final finish. This is the day, 25 years of racing. This is our silver anniversary of the Great Arcata to Ferndale World's Championship Cross Country Kinetic Sculpture Race. Assembly, we're still building. That's what's important, doing it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the race. Probably not going to win any prizes because I'm going to be going real slow. You got the prize? Say, go Coast Guard. Go Coast Guard. I don't have to do a thing. I just have to sit on board. She's going to do all the work in the race.
This race and all the fun that goes on in it is responsible in part by the sponsors who put it together, not counting just the artists, but the people that give them the money to build these works of art, to race them here, like Calisto the Mineral Water Company, like Yakima Products, and then lots of other local companies who sponsor these great events. Big Hammer, remember, Big Hammer. <laughs> Always remember the Big Hammer. And now, the brake and safety test. Sobriety test from you guys, okay? Arms out to your side, okay? And uh, close your eyes, okay? And touch your uh, left forefinger to your right toe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Get in the machine and let's go. In your skull. For the safety of the spectators, we found we have to have rules and we have to test the racers. Because lots of times in the beginning of the race, especially, we used to have racers take off. They never knew they needed brakes until they came to a place where they needed them. So we have to check that out early in the game now to make sure that they're safe for the spectators and for the racers because sometimes artists get caught up in just looking beautiful. Sunscreen, got an eye sunscreen protection, eye protection hat, flotation and flotation hat. device, and dress blue. And dress blue uniform. Absolutely terrific. Let's uh, get ready for the brake test. Bill? Not all the tests in this race are serious. In fact, there's quite a bit of effort and energy that goes into a quality teddy bear. Uh, I don't know why that law is in here, but it seems important to the racers and it seems important to the race committee. So teddy bear technology is definitely a part of this race. In fact, there are many rules that make this a unique and special event for everyone of all ages. Grandpa, feeling strong for this race? No. No, you, you trained uh, hard, what, about five minutes a day for at least uh, the last two days? Or? Well, I've been at it three weeks and I'm still in shape. You know, a lot of fun in this race is to be able to take your ideas, your dreams, put them together and put them into a machine and then go to a great crowd like our audience and show them how it works or doesn't work, whichever, and share that experience with them. In fact, it's been so attractive and so interesting to other people to, to share this with other people that they literally come from all over the world. The media come here to cover it and the people are here to appreciate your either agony of success or your agony of defeat, whichever. All right, I want Dave off the machine. Dave, get off the machine! We're all day. <laughs> You're all day? All day. <laughs> Jonah said the teddy bear was day. Did you ask his name? <laughs> okay. This becomes a major event in all the volunteers' lives. The referees, the racers, the spectators. They all come here for this event to put their energy and effort into it to see it happen. And it's a great way to use their energy. Toothbrush, toothpaste. <laughs> what do you mean in the bucket here? I can't see that you even have a bucket. Why do you have a two-gallon bucket? Do you have any idea why you have to have well, my two toothbrush is in it. My, my toilet paper. <laughs> no, honestly, you don't know why you need a two-gallon bucket? To put out a fire. You got it. Okay, for that, <laughs> pass. Ready? Go, pedal, faster! Go, 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 go. This is not just a parade. These sculptures have provisions to survive for three days over a 38-mile course of mud, sand, and water. With the ninja driver. And your positive attachment for uh, tow purposes. Yes. Right here. Okay. Guaranteed to hold the weight of the yes. sculpture? Or hold the weight of the sculpture. All right, then you pass. Oh, uh, two-gallon bucket or equivalent. I have a uh, two-gallon pail. Good. <laughs> two-gallon pail. You know, to understand what kinetic sculpture is, 
is you have to include motion, kinetic, the word meaning motion. When you add motion to a sculpture, then you also have another ingredient, like uh, it's not just an artistic silhouette that stands static, but you have to look at it with the costume and the movement and everything else that's going on with the machine to get the full concept of what the sculpture is. It's, it becomes more of a dimensional thing than just, say, a static sculpture like David standing there. These wheels, and the way that these people go with their machines to make them do certain things for the crowd are very much a part of the final statement in the artwork. So therefore, it's a lot of fun. And then you add on top of that, to create a kinetic sculpture and to have it work, you add on top of that a certain criteria, like being able to cross water, mud, or sand. That means that that silhouette or that movement will have to consider those factors. So looking at it, you'll think, wow, you know, this sculpture is something to look at alongside the street, but also what is it going to look like when it hits the water, the bay? What's it going to look like in 45 foot of water? What's it going to look like as it comes out in the mud or the sand? Or what will it look like in the Sahara Desert? These are the factors that you have to consider when you judge or watch this race. So let's watch all these artists with their different expressions and their plans and their dreams that they've been working on all year. Let's watch and see what they do as they execute this event, this race, their machine. What is going to happen to them? Their pit crews and everyone else and all the people that have come together, their sponsors and everyone else to make this possible. Let's see what they've done. The racers have just completed the Le Mans start. They ran across the street, jumped in their sculptures, and are now taking off and jockeying for positions. This is a race, so they're trying to become first. However, they're not going to forget the fact that the crowd is watching, and it is an art event, and they want to impress them. Remember now, none of these racers have to be doctors or do they have to have any credentials to do this. There's no prerequisite to entering this sculpture race. In fact, all you really need to do is have the desire to race, to have the desire to be seen or to have your dream put in front of a lot of people, work late at night, give up some time, have a lot of fun, get a lot of your friends to help you, put it all together. So therefore, it's just your expression. There is no, uh, uh, as I said before, no prerequisite. So your dream comes unaltered and goes down this road in front of these people the way you want it to happen. Now there is something that you have to consider here in this race because we don't have any prerequisites. We also have a very high attrition rate. We lose a lot of machines at the start of the race. The dreams that they had at home, the way they thought they would look going down the road and the drama and the romance may not be here. The wheels can very well fall off as they do a lot at the race. In fact, we even have one award for someone who actually breaks down the closest to the starting line, after the starting line. So in other words, we're looking at it, but we also consider the fact that because we have people who are amateurs, who are doing what they want and what they feel and what they dream, and are all in the learning process, enter this race, and so as a result, we lose about a third of them in the race that won't finish. So at the starting line here, we get to see most of the machines, if they get to this point, turn around this corner, we get to see a lot of them that are still working, and the, a lot of these machines, less a few, will make it all the way to the finish line. The excitement part about this race is not necessarily the success of your machine or even the way you look so much as it is the fact that you're having fun and you are participating. That's the main ingredient of this race is I will take a chance in front of a large group, I will participate, and I'll show them it's fun just being human. You know, with all the engineering and the artistic effort and everything like that, the human endurance part really gets a lot of support because we have people here who are interested and happy about what these racers are doing. For the glory, glory of sweat. You know, we mentioned participation, but another thing happens in this event, and that's communication. To do something this size, especially with these weird, strange machines and all the committees that take place, there needs to be a great deal of communication, and there's a lot of learning that goes on during that communication. Like, for instance, to win in this race is, uh, you'll see the racers actually help each other to win. It's almost like to keep the species alive sort of thing, but the communication causes you to get along with somebody or to communicate with somebody at the very worst of the situation, a breakdown or anything where metal and everything else is giving you up. You have to communicate with that person. 
to make the machine so collectively you have a collective wisdom that goes together in keeping this together to keep it at to working. The better you communicate, the better your chances of surviving in this race. Even though this is a race, it's still not really that important that you win. The main thing and the ever grinding thing in every racer here is to finish. They have to finish. They've committed, committed themselves to finish, and they're going to put all their effort together to put it into a finish. Now, here's the problem. They have to get along with each other to do that. They cannot do it singularly. Therefore, you have one, two, three, maybe 20 people with one common goal. Okay, tell me when you're ready. In the back? We need to go forward a minute. Okay. All right. Ready? Work around around. Real slow. Gently, gently. A little more. Gently, gently. A little more. Okay. That one's off. Did it come off? Yeah, it came off. I gotta tighten this derailleur down. Okay. Oh, hey, guys. Woo! Oh, yeah. <laughs> we don't ever stop. <laughs> no, stay where we are. Let him get out of the way because we want to stay on the hard sand. We want to stay on the hard sand. After a relatively simple, easy sand entry, the racers now face uh, the sand dunes like the Sahara Desert, and after that, climbing quite a long hill, then they face Dead Man's Drop. At that point, they're going to lower their machine or ride their machine down this steep incline. Dead Man's Drop is much steeper than it looks here on film. It's about 60 degrees and 200 feet long. It's a very difficult terrain to go over because at this point the sculptures could very well fold wheels. They could break up here very easily because the pressures are being put at different places on the machine other than say it would be on a normal road. The true test here and the biggest test here is for the larger machines. They have the worst time going down this part of the hill. They could break up because of their sheer length or because of their size or weight. So there's a lot goes on here at, the, at this test point for the large machines. Now you noticed earlier that we had a, a fisherman there with a fishing pole and an attractive lure. That is for crowd appeal. There's a lot of interest in having your pit crew and your sculpture work together to complete the artistic expression so the crowd can see and love it. It's an interesting race. However, there's nothing here that you can do. There's no book you can get. There's nobody you can borrow anything from. You have to just take the task on, figure out your own way of doing it, maybe get information from other racers, but you just got to do it yourself. There are many spin-off and side events about this race, such as fundraisers to build machines, contests for various parts of the race, and of course our biggest one is the Rutabaga Queen contest. Here for the Queen! Unlike other events, this race has all age groups in it. Uh, a racer only has to be able to take care of themselves pretty much so to be safe during this race and they can enter it. But the main thing is is that they're all involved anywhere from 14 to 80. And a lot of kids have grown up with this race as just another as part of their life. Like they don't know anything else other than this is what grown-ups and adults do. This has been a real selling point for the adult. We've crossed sand dunes, gone down along the beach in the hard sand, gone down steep hills, and now we're ready for the streets of Eureka. Here we have one of the most popular races in America, the Kinetic Sculpture Race, going past one of the most photographed houses in America, the Ingemar Club. Oh, 
remember when we talked about teddy bears at the start of the race? Well, actually, we're on our way now and going to stop at a teddy bear picnic. Teddy bears, teddy bears, teddy bears, teddy bears, teddy bears everywhere, teddy bears. Meanwhile, back at the mansion, the Ingemar Club, we have the Green Machine entered by St. Bernard's, which is a local high school. We encourage high schools and colleges to enter from all over the world. Well, let me tell you about the shady lady Rolled out on the river in 1880 The show's about to start, so don't be lady To the shady lady So go on in the town with your matey Go and get the gals, tag them on a datey. We'll see you on down at the Shady Lady. Me and my matey. Three, four. Me and my matey. After a long, grueling, fun-packed day, we're just a few yards now from the finish line of the first day of the Kinetic Sculpture Race. It's the first time I missed the first day. It's horrible, horrible, horrible. Are you having fun? But I'm having fun. Right. <laughs> it would probably give me a day to rest my foot. Anyway, so the plan is, it's tonight at 7 o'clock. I'm drafting all the welders. We're going to come together, painters, welders, and everything else, and see if we can't raise this barn for tomorrow's race and then go across the water. Because the Quagmire Queen's got most of its fame in going in the water, you know. In fact, it's famous for rolling over in the water. <laughs> well, I, I think this race is turning out quite well. I, um, I'm a ways to go yet. And how are you this morning, my good man? All kinds of people get involved in this race, from individuals to small and even large businesses. Like, for instance, here, this sculpture is going in for its free breakfast at a locally ran McDonald's. And other sponsors will show their products, show their support, and give assistance to racers any way they can. The local economy benefits from this race, as well as us having a good time. So it's a good chance for a local product to get on national television or even local television. But anyway, we have our sponsors, we have their help, and we need it. Racers now must consider their fate as they approach the water entry. For the glory! Now this is the second day and one of the major tasks of crossing water. These racers are now going to cross 2.2 miles of water. They're going to face tides that get up to seven miles an hour, winds that can blow them completely off course, and of course, remember, they're doing this with a machine that they built, untested as a rule, and just put together by brainstorm and by duct tape and whatever else they can do to put it together and test it right here. Now, the crowd loves to watch this because in a way, as we all know in crowds, we like to see people try, we like to see people win, but it's also a lot of fun to watch somebody roll over in the bay. The bay is cold water. It's not enough to really hurt you bad, but if you're in there more than 20 minutes, you could get severe, get into severe trouble. Here's a team that my heart really goes out to. It's a father-son team. They've worked together hard now to build this machine, and now they're going to test it across this water. Now, this is here again, dangerous water, so the father and son will communicate on a level most father-son teams don't have to. They'll learn about each other. They'll learn how to work together, and it's a great experience for them. Not everything works out like it's supposed to in this race. In fact, this is the testing grounds that really has gone beyond just going down the road and pedaling. This is the part where you really have to float. Your life depends on it. You're working in 40 foot of water. 
The tides here are very swift. It's also, uh, there are various things out there in the water that are scary. Uh, nothing, uh, we've not lost any racers in the, because of man-eating clams, but it's been rumored that they're there. Uh, also, I think that what really goes on in each racer as they're waiting there at the starting line is that all of a sudden now, I've dreamed of this machine, I know it's supposed to work, I know that I've thought of everything, I've figured out how much foam and how much metal and how much this and that, but will it really float? Will my friends really <laughs> go across the water with me or will they go down with me? And lots of machines, lots of sculptures are lost right at this point. Now there's something that needs to be mentioned here is that we always have to have this race during an incoming tide. Now that means the tide can get up to seven miles an hour and force the sculptures in against the shore. If we were to try and do this while the tide were going out, then these sculptures could literally wind up in Tokyo. So we've had to ride along. We've also had the Marine Posse and the Coast Guard help us that there's a certain drift point, that if they drift past a certain point due to wind or some other conditions, then they will be brought back or towed across to the other side. So this is essential that we make this race as safe as possible and also uh, the racer has to have this in mind to make it as safe as possible. So between the two of us, or all of us together, we come up with something that is acceptable. This is an experimental race. This is not something that you can go to the store and buy something for. You have to build this, try it out, see if it works, and so therefore we have a lot of safety precautions that other people wouldn't have to consider in a race like this. It's very essential that the sculpture float. Now, after you've conquered the floating part of it and you're carrying the weight and it's also centered, like the hammer here does a good job of centering its weight, it rides the way it's supposed to. Some machines or sculptures will ride uh, tail heavy or front heavy. And the larger the machine, the greater the technology it takes to get it across, considering the fact that you have to battle winds and all kinds of things, plus there's an, uh, it's very difficult to remain stable in the water like this with a large machine. Now, a large machine or sculpture can roll over, and when it does, there's a lot of people involved, and so safety here, again, is one of the main factors. But it's really ambitious, and it's really difficult to run a machine this size. Now, something else, too, when you're working on a sculpture this size, after you float and after you successfully go in the water, then the rules state that coming out on the other side is important. So you will be racing or still racing as you leave the water and enter the muddy shore or bank on the other side where suction, which is a strange thing, causes a problem. Uh, it will try and keep the wheels down and keep them from rolling. So there's lots of things to consider. It's not just going in the water like here and hoping you float and then hoping that you can propel. It's also coming out of the other side. Technology that's developed in this race has really uh, gone a long ways in, in converting from water to land. back out of the water. We went in. We noticed the back versus pontoons were almost flat. We didn't have them pumped up high enough. Oh. So his paddles were completely under the water, just churning. So we turned around, went back up the ramp, pumped the tubes up, came back around, went out, got booed, you know. Oh. <laughs> Man. Bob and Bob, sailors. <laughs> yeah, they're sailors. Eh? <laughs> no, no, Dwayne, no. Yeah, got, we're going you're not, go. you're not the pilot of this now. <laughs> <laughs> we're going here, we're going to get out and attack over. Right, we got a harbor pilot. Oh, you attack. <laughs> What's attacking me? No. <laughs> now, the crowds that swarm along the shores here really love to watch these entries. They really, I'm afraid, or I like, well, anyway, it happens. They like to watch them roll over, and it happens a lot because they forget a lot of things. So it's a lot of fun, plus the racers now get to cross the bay. Great. You break. Right now? A little bit, I think. It's rumored there is some cheating out in the bay. Yeah. 
Now, like a lot of other events, this one's different in this sense, that not only do you overcome water and sand and mud, but also quite a few racers in this over the years have been handicapped. Like Tim Richter's a racer who dialysizes at night and races in the daytime here. So there, you can mechanically solve all kinds of problems by engineering it so that you can either be, uh, you can be immobile from the waist down or you can design a machine that only works with your arms or, in other words, it's wide open for anyone. There is no criteria for this race, so the, the handicapped or the challenged are more than welcome to enter this race. Fortunately, on this side of the bay, we have the MASH unit, the Mad River Community Hospital, comes out to make sure that racers are safe, provide soup, keep them warm, and to check them out. Here it's straight on, because it's pretty steep. Turn it fast, turn it fast, turn it fast. There you go. about the third sunny day in a row. I don't know how it's going to hold up. Sometimes we have to cancel it in case of sunshine, but uh, I think it'll be all right today. Slimy slope will be fun. Dry and steep. Now, here we are at day three. Now, there's a whole bunch of new adventures here, three major ones for sure, and that is that they have to cross the Crab Slough, which is about a quarter to a half a mile, depending on the tide, crossing that with tides to deal with again, also going across a very narrow bridge at Cock Robin Island, and then crossing the Eel River. After the Eel River, then there's immediately the climb of Slimy Slope, which is a real killer as far as the racers go. It's important there again, a new form of testing their machinery. Then, of course, after that, then they go down country roads, wind their way into the little town of Ferndale. This part of the course gives a racer a chance to visit with their crew. In fact, it's a very calm part of the course. It's, in fact, it's one of my favorite parts of the course. It's a chance to see the wildlife. It's a chance to see if you're racing along. Almost there, guys. We're getting real close. See the barn. This sculpture here is called Bug Eyes, a father and son team. Now the machine that's passing here, coming up behind the fish, is Allie Krause's, and it's really a simplistic statement he's made about sculpture racing. He's aced for many years. In fact, he's raced since he was 16 years old, but in order to ace, which he's done very well at since he started building better and bigger machines, uh, have been uh, that you have to follow the rules completely. You have to stay on the machine and all for it while it's moving forward. You have to uh, adhere to all the water rules. In other words, you have to race the way the race was originally intended to race. Now, this doesn't mean you're out of the race if you aren't acing. It means that if you cheat or if you should take a tow or get your friends to help you or something like that, you're not out. You can still stay in, but you won't become an ace. And if you're not an ace, 
and you can't win any of the major awards. So we're really looking for the perfection in racing. 35 violations later, we're here. 1,100 pounds of aluminum. We have sculptures and machines that come from all over the world. This one happens to be racing under an Italian flag. We've had racers from Japan. We've had racers from Auckland. They come from everywhere for this race. These sculptures will finish the race. However, they may not do it with all of their parts. This is getting rough. How much farther we gotta go? Four miles, eight miles? We're hanging in there. It's the Quagmire Queen escape pod. They threw us off because we were having too much fun. Oh, these must be some of those rare animals they must be trying to protect out here. Endangered species. Endangered species. Otherwise known as, they're on the right Doom side of the room. Iron butterfly. <laughs> on the way to Crab Park. <laughs> Watch out for the rope gets tangled. All right. Keep your tongue out of my... Crab Park is the next great adventure just down the road. Even on a good day like this, the Crab Slough offers still slimy mud, quicksand, currents, and possible high winds. Anything could go wrong here. Now they're racing in the slough, and here comes the Midnight Barracuda jockeying for first place. This is a chance to get ahead of a lot of racers if the water happens to be calm like it is here. However, there's a lot of obstacles that still have to take place and the machines still haven't been fully tested because here they're going to get a new kind of a mud, a new kind of a problem they've never had before. Oh! <laughs> and here we are at Slimy Slope. This is the part of the race now that a loser yesterday could become a winner. This takes out a lot of machines. This is actually a legal push area and the racers don't have to pedal to the top, but a lot of them choose to just to show off what their machines can do. Kinetic sculptures will do anything to get on camera. in their hammer. June has been racing for many, many years. In fact, she's raced a couple of shoes and she's uh, done a fly and now this hammer. 
She does a funny thing, though. She won't let men help her work on it at all. She will only take their advice, but she builds her own machine. She won't have any men help her. It's an all-woman machine, an all-woman-powered machine. This is the last major obstacle in this race. And here we have the Panic Titanic from Hoopaw, California, will attempt and climb Slimy Slope under its own power, its own human power, to continue on down the small country roads, past the farms, and past the always observant cows who rush to the fence to watch the racers go by, and then on into Ferndale. June and Donna now, after minor adjustments, will attempt the slope again, and this time, successfully. Now, Grandpa's an interesting racer. Uh, we don't even know why people get in this race, but he started by flying a kite. We didn't even know how to handle it on the rule books or any of the entry forms, but he flew the kite, and he did it successfully. And we thought, well, that was kind of silly, but then the next year he shows up with something a little better, and pretty soon his machines kept getting better and bigger and bigger until finally he had a pit crew, sponsors from all over the area, and everybody was out to see Grandpa win. Now he's a legend. This is the kidney bean with a very zealous crew they're helping to pull. You know, it's really exciting to me to see this because you have kids playing adult games instead of adults playing kid games. I think this is a good way of showing that being older is a lot of fun. Speaking of kids, this is the Sunny Bray Middle School, and this is a class project. And they all band together, train for months to get ready for this race, and they certainly know how to do it. Now, here's a strong argument for people-powered machines. Now the racers are facing Ferndale for their final glory. They come into Ferndale where the race started, and it was 38 miles ago they've been racing. Here's Allie Krauss proving that you can do it with just a well-modified, detailed bicycle. You know, a lot of thanks go to all the people that make this thing work. There's referees, 
there are uh, MCs, there are sponsors, there are just a whole conglomerate of people that come together to give these racers the racetrack, the 38 miles that they can race on, the glory at the end, the test of their machines, the excitement of what they get to do, and then put it all in front of cameras so it can go all over the world. Here's a machine that does a great job called the Glory Hogs. They do very well what they call themselves. They hog glory. Anyway, the whole race is built on fun. As you can see here, they've stopped in front of the finish line. It isn't important to finish. It is important to become a good show. So this really, in a way, is, you might say, is glory for the racers and a great show for the spectators. great race are the grand champion Hot Rod Lincoln, Engineering and Speed Midnight Barracuda, Mediocre Award Iron Butterfly, Spirit Award Grandpa's Flying Machine, Poor Pitiful Me Award went to All in the Family. The Art Award went to Hammer Goes Hollywood. The KXGO Cash Award went to Woody. This event has been going on now for 25 years. It's affected people all over the world. It's even started other events like this in other areas. It's been a real engineering feat. It's been a challenge. It's been helpful to local economies. It's been a lot of fun. And remember, it all started with my son's tricycle. This is Hobart Brown, glorious founder, and I hope you have enjoyed this, the silver anniversary of the World's Championship Great Arcade at Ferndale Cross Country Kinetic Sculpture Race.